Hi, everyone, and welcome to Diplomats at Work. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to our virtual series where we talk to active duty members of the Foreign Service about their life and work. Uh, the series is a partnership between the American Foreign Service Association and the Una Chapman Cox Foundation. And it's really designed to introduce audiences to the work of the Foreign Service uh, through storytelling. Uh, the work of the Foreign Service is very interesting and it's very, very varied. And we really thought that the a really interesting way to introduce folks to this work is by interviewing and talking to the diplomats themselves. So a few words about our association in case you're not familiar with us. Uh, the American Foreign Service Association is a professional association and the exclusive representative for the US Foreign Service. We have about 16,000 members um, from across six uh, agencies of the US government that have foreign service. And I think um, many of you are familiar, of course, with the State Department, but I don't know if you knew that there are five other agencies uh, where there are foreign service members. Those include the US Agency for International Development, the Foreign Agricultural Service, Foreign Commercial Service, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and the US Agency for Global Media. So our job as the professional association uh, for the Foreign Service and as the voice of the Foreign Service, which is what our tagline, is really to be able to, to share the stories of the Foreign Service far and wide. We want to help tell the story of the Foreign Service to audiences who may not be aware of what the Foreign Service does and how the work of these diplomats and members of the Foreign Service relates to those of us living here in the U.S. So my name is Nadja Rizika and I will be your host for Diplomats at Work. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to a really exciting guest, Evan Cully, uh, who is posted in US Consulate in Nook, Greenland. We're going to be talking to her about Greenland and about her work there. Uh, I think some of you may have also uh, come to our May session of Inside Diplomacy, where we talked to US Arctic coordinator, Jim DeHart about uh, work, uh, foreign policy issues in the Arctic. And it was really a kind of a big picture discussion about US foreign policy in the Arctic and the kinds of diplomatic opportunities that are opening there. So today's discussion, while it's a follow on to that of sorts in, in the sense that we are talking about, we're still talking about the Arctic, but it's really a different take. It's a much more, I think, personal take on being a diplomat in, the, in, in Greenland um, and what that work entails and what life uh, is like in this, I think for what many of us is a distant um, and pretty still foreign land. Um, so, before we get into the really cool content, as I like to call it, I do want to get through a few housekeeping items before we get into the discussion with Evan. So first, uh, if you've joined us before, you'll be familiar with the structure of the event. Um, we are going to be talking to Evan for about 30 minutes where I'll be asking her questions about life and work and what does a public diplomacy officer do? Um, and then we're going to leave about 15 to 20 minutes for audience Q&A. So please enter your questions into the chat box. I think there's a separate Q&A chat box um, and enter them as early as you would like. Also, we'd love to know who is joining us today. So if you um, feel like it, please enter when you ask your question, do enter you know, what your name is and where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we are recording today, uh, several people have asked me that, so we are recording as usual, and we will be sharing this recording on our website and with all those who have registered. Um, and that'll be up in a few days, probably early next week. And then finally, as before, we have a very brief survey for you to take at the very end of the session. So when you log off, it'll pop up for you. It'll take no more than three minutes um, and it will be really helpful for us because it'll help us refine, continue to refine uh, diplomats at work so that we can bring you the kind of information, the kind of stories that, I, that are helpful and interesting to you. So please do take the few minutes to do that. 
Okay, so now that we're done with that, um, let's get to the exciting stuff. So um, welcome, even. It's so great to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and to talk to us about all things Greenland and all things your job. Um, we are really fortunate that you're able to dedicate this time today. So with the next few questions, I want you to help us kind of lay the groundwork kind of for, for what we're going to be talking about. I do want to start off by having you talk to us about your job as a public diplomacy officer and what, what does a public diplomacy officer do? What, what is the job? And where and how does this fit in into the work of overall uh, the State Department? You know, I think, again, a lot of us are familiar with what the State Department does, but how do all these pieces fit together? So I'll have you start us off with that. Great, thanks so much, Nadia. And thanks everybody for joining and um, thanks APSA for this opportunity. For public diplomacy officers, we mainly deal with our audiences abroad. We really do public outreach and talking to the foreign audiences that we're, where we're posted to. So it's a rare opportunity to get to be able to talk to Americans and the people that we represent when we're posted overseas. So I just want to thank AFSA and thank you for uh, reaching out and suggesting this. Um, for what public diplomacy officers do. So what I just said, we do public outreach to our foreign audiences overseas. That includes a lot of different aspects. Um, it's media, so things like doing press conferences. For example, when Secretary Blinken came out to Greenland in May, we helped arrange the press conference for him, which was in an airport hangar in Gengersluslok. Um, we also do answer journalist questions and that kind of thing about the work that we do. Just yesterday, we have a new consul here in Greenland. Her name is Joni Simon. She just started last month. She's fantastic. And yesterday, we started arranging her first media interviews here just so that she can explain her role as consul. Um, so the public affairs officer, me, was just sort of sitting in the background making sure that that was going OK. We also do, and my favorite part is exchange programs, so things like academic, educational, professional exchanges. And in a non-COVID year, this um, generally involves people coming from the United States and going overseas and foreigners coming to the United States. And we're really excited to start those up again. We've been very fortunate in Greenland that um, Greenland has done a great job mitigating the pandemic. They've had, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of just over 60 cases countrywide since the start of the pandemic, uh, which is, as you can tell, really low. No, no hospitalizations, no fatalities. So we have been able to bring a limited number of people here, including some English teaching assistants for uh, Fulbright Ful English teaching assistants who came to Sistimute last year. So that kind of exchange and being able to do that kind of people to people where Greenlanders get to meet Americans and Americans get to meet Greenlanders, that's something that's really kind of the backbone about what we do as public affairs officers. So it sounds like the job of a public affairs officer is really to sort of represent the U.S. and kind of paint that picture to the local um, in whatever country you're posted in to the locals of what America really is and who Americans are. Is that a fair assessment of what your job is? Yeah, it's about explaining uh, foreign policy to overseas audiences so that they can kind of understand what the bilateral relationship is. So the Policy officers, so political and economics officers will do a lot of negotiations and work with our home office in DC to come up with foreign policy for the two countries that we're working with. And public affairs officers explain that and get buy-in and have people, if folks have questions about it, we kind of field those questions and we come up with answers so that we can really explain what it is we're doing as a consulate or as an embassy. Great, thank you. That's a, uh, it's a fascinating and I think very important job, um, an important piece of the overall work of the State Department. Okay, so switching gears, but still kind of staying in the laying of the groundwork um, about today's discussion. Tell us a little bit about Greenland. Um, I think, again, as I mentioned earlier, I think Greenland remains for many of us a pretty remote, distant land. Um, and maybe you could tell us about the territory of Greenland, what the climate is like, what the main industry is, and, you know, what life is like. Paint us a picture of all of that. Sure, it's uh, kind of hard. Greenland's a, uh, it's amazing. It's a wonderful place. I am every day extremely happy that I get to be here. As an American, if you've ever flown to Europe, you've probably like flown over Greenland and maybe on a clear day, you've been able to see some of the ice, but to actually land here is like a completely different experience. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, it's a very different place. My last overseas assignment was in Beijing, and I don't think you could get a more different follow-on. So in Greenland, it's a population of 56,000 people total. 
over the cross across the entire island. The island is actually about, I think, three times the size of Texas or um, twice the size of Alaska, to put it in American terms. So you can imagine 56,000 people spread over that. It's not like you get a lot of big pockets of population. In Nuuk, the capital where I live, it's 19,000 people, which is about a third of the total population of Greenland. The next uh, largest city is Sisimiu, and they've got a population of just upwards of 6,000. So pretty instantly, you gotta get a sense of like the scale of what it is that you're talking about when you come here. It's just, it's not like where you've been, it's very small town, but at the same time, not small town in a very rural way. Oftentimes it feels kind of like a mini European city, just everything done, sm smaller amounts of everything. Um, in terms of the industries, I'll say fishing is huge here, probably obviously with everybody living along the coast. Uh, fishing makes up about approximately, I think, 95% of its exports, and it's about a third of Greenland's economy. In terms of politics, Greenland is a part of the Kingdom of Denmark, like the Faroe Islands, um, but Greenland has a strong Arctic Inuit identity, much like a lot of our, our state of Alaska and across northern Arctic Canada. Most of the population are Inuit and about 40% of them speak Greenlandic and Inuit language as their first language. But across the island, the, the major language is still Danish and a distant third is English. So one of the things that we're working on here in order to create uh, increased tourism and sustainable tourism is um, working on English language programs for, for students. Usually when folks think about Greenland, they think about the ice cap. Um, for international media, that's definitely looms large. For Greenlanders, I think I've been here for over just about a year now. And I've been to the ice cap just two times. You fly over it a lot and it's beautiful. And I still love that whenever I'm in a plane in Greenland, everybody's glued to the window. You never get tired of looking out at it. It's, it's truly amazing. Um, and of course, in terms of climate change, if the ice cap in Greenland and Antarctica melt at their current rates, I think we're looking at three to five inches of um, sea level rise over the course of the century. So there is still a lot of work that's being done up there. But in terms of businesses and life here, I'll say that everything is small compared to America. So like the university, there's only one university in Greenland, Elis Matusofik, or the University of Greenland, and they graduate less than 100 students a year. Um, they have four high schools across Greenland in, the, in four of the major cities, and that's it. So if you come from a smaller settlement, then you'll have to move. They have dormitories at the, at the high schools to house the students. Um, all of the government ministers and folks like that are always double or triple hatted. I think the current Minister of Foreign Affairs also covers business, climate and trade. So everybody here has got a lot of different things that they're working on. Um, and when you meet somebody who's working on one field and you're talking to them about something, it's very common that they'll end up, you'll talk about a different project and then they'll be like, oh, I'm also involved in that. So it's helpful to have wide ranging conversations with lots of folks because you just don't know what folks are into. I was working with one woman on a different project on geology, and it turns out that she's also a board member at one of the local schools. Everybody crosses, everybody's got volunteer work. It's a small population, but with so much to do, a lot of people are really happy to take on more to do more for it. Wow, that's fascinating. What a wonderful picture you painted for us of, of, of Greenland. I'm really excited to find out more. Um, I do want to get into now the U.S. diplomatic relationship with Greenland, kind of the history of it. But before we get into it, you work at the U.S. consulate um, in Greenland, and there is a U.S. embassy in Denmark. So what is, for those of us who may be new to this, can you walk us just through the difference of what a U.S. consulate does versus a U.S. embassy? I think a lot of us are familiar with an embassy, but what, what's the difference um, of the two and you know, sort of how would you explain that? Sure. Um, so at the most basic level, an embassy is uh, located in the capital city of a country or kingdom, and a consulate is usually posted to a big, big city nearby. So in the US, if you're gonna have an embassy, they're all posted to Washington, DC. And if there's a consulate, they might be in something like New York or San Francisco. Um, so for us, because Greenland is part of the Kingdom of Denmark, the capital of the Kingdom of Denmark is in Copenhagen. So that's where the embassy is. And um, we're uh, at the capital and largest city of Greenland in Nuuk, so that's where the consulate is. Both of us kind of handle a lot of the similar situations and uh, issues. For example, our number one priority overseas is always American citizens. So if there's an American citizen that's in trouble overseas, they'll always contact the embassy or consulate and we're gonna try and help them out as best we can. Um, apart from that, we'll work on different diplomatic issues or um, trade negotiations or educational exchanges in the area where we're posted to because Greenland and Denmark are pretty separate, not just in terms of land, but also I think 
I think we're about 2,000 miles away, but now that I say that, I'm like, maybe it's 2,000 kilometers. I've been living in Europe too long to know the difference between these anymore. It's a, it's um, but we're at least, okay, <laughs> we're at least uh, four hours in terms of time. So it helps to really be on the ground, to be local, to be there in order to make those relationships between different people at the embassy or consulate and the folks that you're actually working with day to day. Having said that, the embassy did handle Greenlandic matters for a long time and they did a great job at it. But as we started to focus more on the Arctic, it made more sense for us to actually be here in person. Well, thank you for that segue into my next question, <laughs> which is that I know I was reading that the um, US diplomatic presence with um, or relationship with Denmark goes back to, I think the 18th century and I think the first embassy or the precursor to the embassy was very early on in the 19th century. But the diplomatic, our diplomatic presence in Nook hasn't been as, um, I would say, consistent. And it started I would, around World War II and then it closed and it reopened. So I would love for you to kind of walk us through that um, history of our presence in Greenland. Yeah, happy to. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned Denmark. The, the embassy there is currently celebrating 220 years of diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Denmark. So that means 1801 was the start of our embassy over there. So good job. Um, yeah, for Greenland, it was a bit different. So before, Greenland was always handled by Denmark. Um, but in 1940, Denmark was invaded by the Nazis, and we stepped in as sort of like a protectorate over Greenland. And so a lot of our first interest here was basically, you know, working on the World War II issues, weather stations that were set up around that provided critical data for the allies um, to maintain control of the just seaways around the island. Um, but in 1940, that's when the first consulate was established here. And that time, Nuke was, I can say Nuke fine, but I have a hard time saying Gotthold. I think that was the name of, it's in okay. Danish. Yeah, of the town. Not speak Danish, yeah. But that was the, the old name of Nuke. But at the time that the that the consulate was first established, I think there was something like 600 residents. So I thought 19,000 was small when I got here, but 600 is a different kind of order of magnitude smaller. And then a uh, funny little fact is that they actually had to order the consulate building from a Sears and Roebuck catalog and build it themselves. So things have thankfully changed. I came into a ready-built place. <laughs> Um, but that building actually still stands. It's across the street from Nuke's only, uh, from Greenland's only mall, Nuke Center, which is in downtown Nuke. Um, but yeah, so that was opened in 1940 and then it closed in 1953, I think primarily due to budgetary reasons and the end of the war made it not so important that we stayed. And uh, I think the strong allied relationship with Denmark and Greenland, the US also certainly played a part. But then in June, 2020, we reopened in the middle of, well, what seems now is I think the early days of a pandemic that will, continue. But uh, we started in June 2020. And at that time, there was only one diplomat on the island. That was my uh, former boss, the Consul Sung Choi. It's the first diplomat here in all 67 years. And then I came about a month later. Um, yeah, so there's been a lot going on in Greenland between that time. I don't want to sound like, you know, we, we yeah. stepped out and didn't come back. There's a long relationship between the embassy and Greenland, um, you know, doing just covering Greenlandic matters. And there's also a huge amount of scientific uh, cooperation between things like our National Science Foundation, NSF, and different organizations here in Greenland. Another fun part about our involvement in Greenland is that one of the oldest um, ice uh, centers in the world it, for like studying climate change and the rest of it is on Summit Station. It was erected, I think, about in the early 1990s, and it's been running since then. It's at the highest point of the ice cap, and year-round, there are scientists that are posted there in order to do experiments, and when the scientists can't be there, there's always somebody there to sort of manage what goes on there. It's really cool. One of the first things I got to do when I came out here was uh, fly out to Summit Station. I stayed on the ground for about 45 minutes of just like excitedly taking videos and pictures of ice, and then immediately fly back, but um, it's really neat to get out there. And the way to get out there, the only way to do it is to fly over on Air, Air Force, um, Air, National Air Guard planes that are equipped with skis. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I recommend it if you get the chance. Wow. That's, that's, that sounds very, very interesting and very cool. Um, so I understand that the U.S. And, I, and Iceland are the only countries that have a formal diplomatic presence in Greenland. Yep, that's right. Yeah, we're the only ones. So there's the two consulates and Iceland has one diplomat and we have three. So really, really outdoing ourselves over here. <laughs> no kidding. 
Um, so you talked about uh, a little bit, address some of parts of my next question, but I'd love for you to dig into it a little bit more. So you, the US consulate was reopened last year, last June. And of course, it's, I'm sure, not easy to reopen a console that's been closed for, what, 50 some years. Um, but of course, to do it in a pandemic must be immeasurably harder. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what the process of reopening a consulate and reestablishing a presence is like. Um, and then what, what is it that the consulate, we did talk about this, but it would be great to revisit. What is it the consulate does exactly in terms of specific projects and the kind of things that, that um, everyone is involved in? I know that you have, um, in addition to you, your two other colleagues, one of them is a USAider as well. And it'd be interesting to hear what kind of work goes on there as well. Yeah. So um, like I say, the consulate opened in June last year. So we're just, we just celebrated our one year this June. Um, at the same time we did that, we switched out consoles. So we had some Choi for our first year, and now we've got Joni Simon, who just started up. And in addition to Joni and me, who both work for the State Department, we have David Brown, who's a senior AID development officer, um, who's been doing, like I say, a lot of people here end up doing a lot of different work, and they all overlap. So all three of us end up sharing a lot of the same contacts, but we all sort of work on different areas. So David's main focus is working on different things about things like how to um, reinvigorate the sustainable tourism industry here. Things that are helping Greenland develop in its economy in different ways. As I said, they do primarily fishing. So anything that we can do that can help them in capacity or education or, or whatever they're looking for to work on different areas of their economy. That's what we're kind of doing an assessment right now to see what it is they're looking for and where the US can give resources. Um, in terms of setting up the consulate, there's a lot that has to go into it. And it's, it, you know, it's once in a lifetime opportunity. And I'm always going to be really grateful that I had the chance to do this, to start at like a basic ground level and really just going out there, flying out to places, meeting people for the first time and explaining them what the U.S. government is doing in Greenland and what it is that we can do for them and what kind of relationship we're looking for. But yeah, we go out to different places. There's still, like I said, we can travel domestically, which has really been great. And when we do that, we get to take meetings with folks that are just working in all kinds of different areas. Like I say, I'm kind of focused on English language learning and um, developing things like professional and educational exchanges. So I meet with people like, um, let's stick with tourism. If they're working on trying to figure out um, how to build different tourist networks or something or how to attract folks, then we might be able to have, um, for example, the U.S. Embassy did have a, sustainable, a speaker on sustainable tourism come out to Sisimiut in 2019. And then they led a workshop and they sort of showed like best practices from our own experiences in those areas. So we've been, as we establish those contacts, we try and work on different areas that they're looking into. And we just keep on trying to build the relationship and build and help develop that, help them develop the fields that they're working on. With us being so small, there's a lot that has to go on. And part of the other role of the public diplomacy officer is to maintain things like our Facebook and Instagram so that everybody here can also see what it is that we're interested in, what we've been doing, where we've been traveling, who we've been meeting. And as they can see that, then folks do get in touch with us and let us know what it is that they're doing and seeing if we can come out and meet them next time we're in town. That's great. So are you still, you said the old Sears and Robot Roebuck building is um, you're not in it right now but are you which are do you have your own building or are you sharing no yeah we were very fortunate that so there's Arctic Commando or Joint Arctic Command um, has an office in what's called Nukes Old Harbor so that's where we are we just take up three small rooms in, in the office out here we're really fortunate that they were able to to house us so quickly um, but having said that, we are looking, it's going to be a longer term project about trying to find a place that can be kind of purpose built for us. And we have a long wish list of things that we would like to include in that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so far, we're just still an Arctic commando. It feels very much like a Starbucks startup almost, right? <laughs> Yeah, and actually, it's very funny, because again, my last overseas assignment was in Beijing at one of our largest embassies in the world. And now I'm working out of three small rooms, and I'm training our local staff up and like, you know, what an embassy is and what a consulate is in an environment that I feel is just very different than what most embassies and consulates are like. Yeah, that's, I think, probably a invaluable experience. The, yeah. The thing. So you, you said you arrived in Greenland about a month after the consulate opened, so last July-ish? Yep, I'm almost at my one year. It was July 24th. 
well, congratulations, happy anniversary. So what was your experience <laughs> like in those first uh, months and, and days um, of starting this new life in such a unique place? and work yeah. in such a, again, a start, almost a startup environment. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I still remember, like every time I land in Nuke Airport, I remember the first time I landed in Nuke Airport and I was like, oh my God, I'm home. As I looked at like the two rooms of Nuke Airport and I was like, this is my airport now. It's just very different scale and very interesting. Um, but when I got home, I got home and my view, thankfully, is amazing. They got me apartment somehow right over the fjord and I just like stare out at it. So my first two weeks of quarantine, I had an iceberg that was like perched outside my window and I was like, I was locked inside basically. So I just watched this like icy hourglass tick down my time while I was in quarantine. But then uh, once I got out, <laughs> thankfully, I've been able to travel a lot. So like I say, because we're starting up, I think one of the most important things this year has just been establishing relationships across the island. It's not enough for us to just be a nuke. That's not like the only thing that, that falls under our purview. We really do have to make sure that we're visiting different people and places and understanding the full scope of the island. So my first trip, I think I was like a couple weeks here before out of quarantine before I went to Ganger Luswak and I saw the ice sheet. And then I went down to southern Greenland into the southern capital of Kortok, which has a population of somewhere over 3,000. And Narsok, which was about 1,200. And I think Narsarsok is just under 200. And you go to these different places and you learn what's going on there and like the schools and the opportunities and what folks there are looking for. And then um, after that, when I got back to Nuuk, you know, a town of 19,000, I was like, wow, metropolis. Like it was a completely different perspective after I had been able to get out. And I still see it that way. My first trip to Copenhagen after I'd been here, I remember being at the airport and I was like, wow, I think there are more restaurants in the airport than there are in Nuuk. <laughs> but like once you get used to the shift in perspective, it's really not that bad. And it's always feels like coming home to come back home to Nuuk now. Wow. So now that you're a year in, how, how are we feeling about life in Greenland? Sounds like you're quite well settled in. Have you been able to travel much um, through the island and experience it sounds like you were, you have it sounds like you have been for work but have you been able to sort of do it for leisure and kind of be a tourist yeah i think that it's i, I will say this and i think i should do this in the future when you get a job whose portfolio covers tourism industry you get to do a lot of fun stuff yeah. There was, um, I got up to go to Illicet, which is kind of like the tourist capital of Nuuk, of Greenland, which has um, the Ice Fjord, which is a UNESCO heritage site. And it's it's completely amazing. And I definitely recommend going out to visit it. Um, oh, these are from a yeah, <laughs> different trip sure. to the Arctic Circle Trail. But Illicet is just like icebergs and it's gorgeous. But I was taking a meeting when I was up there and a man just like, he told me where the meeting spot was. And he said, oh, a boat will pick you up to take you here. And I was like, okay, great. I was traveling with a senior foreign service officer at the time and her and I were just like, okay. So we got on a boat, which turned out to be like two fishermen on a boat and they just stuck us on the boat. And I was like, cool. And they were like, yeah, this could take anywhere from half an hour to two hours. And I was like, great. <laughs> and it ended up being like 45 minutes, like icebergs surrounding us on all sides. And then we get to a tiny settlement and we have to park on the ice, like on ice for sea ice. And then we get out and we walk across the sea ice. And this is in April when a lot of stuff is melting. And kind of disconcertingly, the first three inches of that are pretty slushy. So you just get out and you walk on slush and you really hope that there's like something thick under you. But we went out to, and the uh, settlement was called Okatsu, and we were learning about, you know, a, an artist residency up there. So like it's tourism, it's work, it's been just like a wonderful experience unlike any place else that you'd be able to go or serve. Um, yeah, it was utterly fantastic. <laughs> wow, that sounds surreal almost from my perspective. So you sent us a few pictures and I, I think these were from your personal travels through yeah, yeah. versus work travel. So do you want to walk us through some of these? They're um, sure. so beautiful. Yeah, well, yeah, I can go through these. So actually one of the fun things that I've done, so personal travel completely, I even paid for my own tickets, was to go up to Ganger Kluswak and do a walk. To Sisimiu. So one of the fun tidbits about Greenland, there are no roads that connect cities. You cannot drive from one place to the other. It doesn't happen. The only place where you will be able to do it eventually on ATV is on this area. But this is a very famous, I guess if you're into this sort of thing, hiking trail. 
It's 160 kilometers. It typically takes nine days. Um, on our last day of hiking for nine days where I was dead tired, we met a guy in his like 50s who'd hiked it six times and was now doing it in five days. So that was kind of shameful. But at any rate, for us, it was very difficult nonetheless. Um, but it was utterly breathtaking. The first six days, we didn't see anybody else. It was just open space like there are no trees in Greenland except for in the very far south so all you see is just like pristine yeah this photo kind of looks like the beach in the Mediterranean and there it is it's just like to show a different side people always think of the ice and the cold but it's really beautiful and there's a lot of diversity and a lot of vegetation that you don't get elsewhere in the world um yeah it's we had to hike for nine days with all of our food on our backs and stuff so the packs got lighter or we got stronger unclear by the end of the trip. Um, but yeah, it was just like a, a huge achievement, a really amazing thing. And folks here in Greenland are always really happy to hear that somebody else has done, it's called the Arctic Circle Trail. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that at the bottom there, you can see this is leading into Sisimut. So this is at the very end of the trail. And you can see that cairn, the pile of stones has a little red half circle and that's the sign of the Arctic Circle Trail. Really just a magical once in a lifetime because I'm certainly not doing it again, but once in a lifetime opportunity. <laughs> That's amazing. If it's supposed to take nine days for people, it would probably take me a month to get through all of this. It looks like um, you're you're kind of like uh, motivated by the fact that you have nothing else. Like you cannot turn around. You can turn around. But like, why would you turn around? You started. You have to do it. So you just have to keep going and you'll run out of food and there's nothing you can't re up. There's no shops. There's no nothing along the way. You just have to keep walking if you ever want to get that burger. We talked about the burger in Sisimu for maybe like a total of 20 hours of walking. That is a great <laughs> um, so you mentioned, you know, the vegetation and, and defying some of the sort of stereotypes that we may have um, where Greenland is concerned. But I also remember you telling us that there are very few trees in Greenland. Yeah, there are. So if you, it's always fun to take a look at the tree line, like a, a map that shows the tree line across the world. You know, if, if you go certain, if you go farther north because of permafrost and different reasons, trees can't lay their roots, they can't grow. So in Greenland, the, the tree line covers just this one little dot in the south. And so in Narsarswak, there's an arboretum and you can see the, I would say they've got like uh, over a hundred trees there. And for those of us that are like really missing trees, that our consul, Joni Simon, just went down there. And if you look at our Instagram, you can see a picture of her just like very excited to be around trees again. And uh, usually when we could take a trip outside, it's like me just like looking at leaves, like, oh my God, look at this. <laughs> it is true. We, we get very few of that kind of thing. But I mean, that does mean your view goes on for forever. There's nothing to block it. Anytime you go anywhere, you can just see for miles and miles or kilometers and kilometers. <laughs> wow. Wow. Beautiful. Okay. So I think to wrap up this um, part of our discussion before we move into the Q&A, you mentioned um, how different this post is from your previous post. I think you were in Beijing and I don't remember where you were before that, but Vancouver. a little bit about how different um, all those experiences have been and, and how different, you know, being in Greenland is now in terms of your I job. Honestly, you there's talked about life being quite different in a, in a town of 19,000, um, but yeah. Yeah, there's almost no way that they are similar, except that I am in both places. <laughs> to go from Beijing to Nuke, I'm like, I don't know where to start with the differences on that one. The job is hugely different. I mean, in, in Beijing, it's a big embassy. There's a lot of different people working on a lot of different things. And you have one thing that you do very well. Um, here, because it's just me and one other officer, we kind of do all things. I'm going to say well. I'm going to say very well. We do all things very well. Um, but maybe that we do them in a bit of a smaller scope. But um, then in terms of life and everything, shoot, Beijing and Vancouver were just hugely different than Nuke in lots of different ways. I'll say Vancouver probably is more similar just because the access to the outdoors was really prevalent. You can just, you know, go out and hike whenever you want to. For as small as a town as it is, there's when you get out, it doesn't feel small at all. A lot of folks here really like you have access to a boat you're, or your family does or you own one or something. But life on the water is very important to folks here. So, and when you get out there, it just feels like everything is huge again. You know, Nuke might be only 19,000 people, but you have access to things that are just immense. Mm. So kind of the, the scale of life is just very different working here and living here than it is anywhere else I've been. I'm no longer like one thing along with everybody else. I'm like one thing in a huge expanse. 
So it really just changes your perspective. I think it'll be a, a, a real trip going back to the States and like living there again after this one. Yeah. And your job, I mean, you said you sort of handle a lot more, um, but thematically, is it different or sort of? Yeah, um, I would say, well, it depends. So every time that you get posted overseas, your embassy will come up with um, what's called our integrated country strategy. So like the goals for the mission that we're going to be handling over the years to come. So as long as those are different for each place, your job will kind of be different for each place. So we've been focusing, like I say, on exchanges for like sustainable tourism, which I didn't have to do in China so much. They have a completely different set of issues over there. Um, so yeah, whatever the, the themes are, are kind of determined from above and then you just work with them. For Greenland, there was so much interest and there still is so much interest in the Arctic and the States that I knew things like climate and environment and education and English language learning and tourism were gonna be important um, when I came up here. Being able to work on those and like get them while they're still developing, Greenland is really happy to have us and it's been just a really wonderful experience being able to share what expertise we have in our own private sector or working with the National Park Service so that they can do uh, like a series of webinars that they've done and just connect with the expertise we have back home with what Greenlanders are looking for in order to develop their own areas. Yeah, and I think, you know, this space will increasingly grow. As we had the discussion with um, Coordinator DeHart, I think there's more and more interest in being active um, diplomatically and otherwise uh, in the Arctic. And I think it'll probably grow as there are more opportunities being open now with, you know, the melting ice and an increasing sort of transportation routes. So I'm, I'm guessing it'll only become bigger and more interesting for people to come and, uh, and work there. Okay, so we've come to the end of our sort of discussion questions and I'd love to switch over now and to get to our audience questions. I think we've gotten a bunch. I will try to get through as many as I can possibly uh, get through in the next 15 minutes. Um, so I'm going to take them sort of thematically. I think we're gonna group them. So um, there are a few questions about the consulate and um, living in Greenland. So one, uh, how many local staff members do you have in the public affairs section and the whole consulate? Okay, well, that one's an easy one. Um, so when I started, we had one local staffer and she's utterly amazing. We were so lucky to have her. She's now on maternity leave, eagerly awaiting the birth of her child. Um, so she's still on the books, so we've got her. And then we've just hired two more in April and May. One of them as working as a political and economic specialist. And then I've got one in the public affairs section. So it used to be I was the public affairs section, but now we are the public affairs section in Nuke. Um, but she's amazing. She started in May. In her first two weeks, we already had the secretary's visit, so she hit the ground running. Um, but she's been so important to have. She speaks Greenlandic and Danish, and um, she's a Greenlander from Nuuk. Um, and she's been able to work on our social media and make sure that everything's translated correctly. It's really important for us that we have uh, Greenlandic as one of our main languages that we're using. So her being on board has just been fantastic. But that's it for local staff. USAID is, hand, is trying to hire another one right now. And then we'll be at our full capacity of seven people once ours reemerges from her maternity leave next year. Wow. Um, and this one is in a similar vein, but um, this is from a retired public diplomacy officer who asks, this may be out of your wheelhouse, but is there a real demand for visas to the US? And how many consular officers work there? I'm presuming in the consulate. Uh, okay, so none. We both have consular commissions because that way we can handle anything for American citizen services that happen over here. In case of emergencies or anything like that, it helps for us to be equipped in that way. But for visas, unfortunately, folks here do still have to go back to Denmark. But fortunately, they normally are visa waivers. So they'd be able to travel to the U.S. without one. And just for students and things like that, for longer stays, that they would have to go to Copenhagen for the visa. Okay. Switching slightly, um, this is about kind of the outreach work that you've been doing and how do you engage local Inuit communities and are there any specific entities that you work with as part of that outreach to Inuit communities? Yeah, I always, I know that it's like a common thing, but for Greenland, I think it's about 80% of the population is what we would consider Inuit, Arctic Inuit. So Inuit populations are right there. Yeah. So in terms of engaging them, it's pretty much, that's what we do all day, every day. 
um, for organizations. There are a lot of, here they've been working on sort of ties across Arctic Canada and Arctic North America for a long time, and then also across the Nordic Arctic. So Greenland's in a really special spot where it's kind of between these two different, um, let's say, sets of Arctic relations. So they've got uh, things like there's an Arctic Sounds music concert, um, the festival that happens in Sisimiut in early April uh, every year. That's been going on for a number of years. And I've engaged the, them. It's again with them. It's usually just one person. So the person who ends up running that or is in charge of that, who started that. And they do a lot of different things that are also involved in music and exchanges here in Greenland. So we reach out and we talk to them about different kinds of resources that we have, whether it's our small grants program, or uh, our Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs also has a music uh, fellowship program called One Beat, which will send uh, musicians to the United States for short-term fellowships. So I talked to him so that we can get our sort of, we can let him know about the opportunities and he can in turn let the musicians know. And so that's like one way that we would sort of, you know, reach out to different people here working in different areas. Like I say, in terms of Inuit, it's that's what we got. So it's not like I have to reach out to a specific person for that, for that getting to that indigenous community. It's pretty much, I'm just reaching out to Greenlanders for that. And I think uh, this is not part of that question, but I think I remember you saying that there's a lot of interest from the Greenlandic um, Inuit community to connect with our Alaskan Inuit communities as well. And what, yeah. it, do you have a role in making those connections? Yeah, so they've been doing it for years on their own, which is fantastic. Um, but sometimes when we find out that they have been doing that, we say, okay, well, how can we help develop this further? Mm -hmm. So if there's been, for example, the embassy a couple of years ago before the pandemic started had an Alaskan band um, as part of our American Music Abroad program. I think they came over to um, uh, Nuuk and Sisimiut, and it was called Bamua, and they led uh, performances and workshops for kids. They were showing things like drum dances that happen in Alaska and the different ways that they do them in Alaska versus they do them here in Greenland. And so that's one of the things that we can do in order to sort of connect those cultures. If I find out that folks here are interested in establishing those ties, then again, I point them to different programs or resources that we might have that might be able to help them explore them even further or deepen them or, or anything that we can do that sort of like emphasizes that relationship. And it's not it sounds like we're doing it for our benefit, but in truth, it's Greenlanders have always been interested in this and Alaskans have always been interested in this. I spent one of my tours was in Vancouver, Canada, and there I was around a lot of Arctic Inuit as well. Just, you know, when you travel around up there. And one of the things that always gets you when you come to Greenland is that Greenlandic is a living language. People use it all day. It's not something that you have to, like, look up or try and save necessarily. It's really functional. So, and it's actually quite closely related to Alaskan languages. So being able to have those ties is something that people on both sides are really interested in sort of exploring. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'll, uh, I'm trying to get to cover as many categories of questions. So we might jump around a little bit. Um, there's one uh, question about the Arctic coordinator, Jim DeHart mentioned that science uh, diplomacy or rather international collaboration in science is very strong in the region. I think you did mention um, the center that you visited at the- at, at Summit the, Station. Uh, yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And are you, I assume the consulate is somehow involved at least in some level of coordination. Yeah. Um, sure. So there's a couple of different things that we can talk about there. So one of the things that's happened in Greenland, and they've wanted it to be every year, but because of the pandemic, it wasn't last year, but it's called Greenland Science Week. And U.S. researchers will also participate in that. As you are probably aware, a lot of climate science is going to happen up on the ice. And this is where a lot of people are coming to come to like learn about what's going on and do this research that's really integral to where we're going as a planet over the next forever. Um, so a lot of that research is done by U.S. or funded by U.S. government money by National Science Foundation. Or we have actually a team coming up soon, I think in August and September from NASA, which is their program is Oceans Melting Greenland or OMG. <laughs> <laughs> Best acronym ever. But they are they come up here and they do a really cool project where they're going around the island and um, dropping sensors in to test the temperature of the water. So the, the melt on the ice sheet isn't just coming above from the sun hitting the ice. It's also coming, as the glaciers come off, there's water underneath them. And as more warm water is coming, that's helping them melt from below. And along with the top melt, it's actually coming and creating situations where those glaciers are gonna calve more frequently. 
So NASA has been dropping sensors in all these really remote places all over the coast of Greenland to see how that water temperature has been rising over the years. I think this is their last year that they've been that they're doing it. But they'll also participate in Greenland Science Week and um, they'll do a couple of different things before that as well. They did a great outreach earlier this year to high schools in Sisimiut and in Nuuk and elsewhere across the island where the lead um, uh, principal investigator who goes by uh, Climate Elvis, so you can look him up on Facebook. He has cybers and he does also perform. But uh, he did a great presentation just sort of explaining that and showing the amazing pictures and videos that he took in like parts of Greenland that nobody gets to get to. So there's a lot of different areas for science that, that the U.S. has been working on here in the consulate. We kind of we know about all of them and we try and connect and we try and arrange that kind of outreach so that the science that's happening on the ice sheet and around it doesn't just happen there, doesn't just go back to the U.S., doesn't just stay with the researchers, that Greenlanders can also get the experience and understand what it is that's going on here. Yeah, that's great. OK, so now um, a little more uh, personal, I guess. The question is, how do you deal with the months of light and the months of dark? <laughs> if, we can, if we can take a step back and explain that in the summer it seems to be light almost 24 7 and in the winter you have how many what, two to three hours of daylight yeah I'll say that you know in terms of like the surprising thing I have a friend from Texas who is constantly amazed that I'm living in a cold place but the cold never bothered me anyway it's not cold that's the problem but the the light is something that's like very new to me so yeah, in the summertime, it's pretty much nonstop. We get a bit where in Nuuk, because Nuuk is actually below the Arctic Circle, so it does dip a bit and we'll get about three hours of what we can you know, generously call sunset, but it's still like quite light out. I'll say this from experience, it never really gets like dark in the summertime. Um, and in the wintertime we get in general, even on the cold, the, the darkest day, we've got about three hours of sunlight. I'm just the type of person that prefers this, but the, the sunlight in the wintertime when it's on the snow, I think it feels really bright and wonderful and I get a lot of joy from that. Whereas the never ending sun, there's a lot of times where it's like 11 and you're just not sure why you're still awake, but you don't know if you can go to sleep. So you do like all these measures, blackout curtains, night mask and the rest of it in order to get used to it. I will say folks here, judging from the sounds outside my window, really love staying up all night in the summertime. Uh, it's a lot quieter in the winter. <laughs> But all around, it's it's just such a different kind of thing. Instead of the four seasons of like spring, summer, winter, fall, we just get uh, light and dark is how it kind of feels. It's definitely, there's no snow right now. So we definitely, it's not snow all the time. But from my perspective, the larger shift is just in terms of quantity of light. Hmm. And do you have those lamps, right? The, the sure do, lamps yeah. I'm sure that you... Yep. You get I bathe like a flower under them every winter for at least half an hour while I do my morning reading. <laughs> Listen, whatever it takes. Um, okay, so then one question about the um, population, I guess, settlement of Greenland, which is, uh, it seems that it's really populated just along the coast. And is that because it's too cold or the terrain is just not easily permissible um, for... Yeah. So. Yeah, so the settlements happen in different ways. And I'll say, yes, there's ice in the middle, so you can't really do much with that. And like, it's not just ice and normal, there's ice and wind, snow still falls. One of the reasons that the ice sheet, it, it grows and it declines. It's not been like a steady set. So the snow in the winter that falls aids and compacts it. And as things go over the years, things will shift. The ice moves constantly. So the glaciers are constantly spreading out from the ice sheet. And that's what sort of comes out at the edges and, and calves and forms the icebergs. So the ice itself is not not a steady thing that anybody would be able to really spend a lot of time at. Summit Station takes a lot of effort to maintain them being where they are. Um, but for the coast, some of the main reasons where the settlements have and where why they are where they are are different things like sea ice. If the harbor historically has been blocked by sea ice, then they didn't get a lot of shipping up there. There's one town on the East Coast called Tasilak, um, the largest town on the East Coast, and they've got about 2,000 residents. Really interesting. East Greenland is a almost completely different thing. They speak a different language, East Greenlandic, than West Greenland. So, but the only so the largest population of East Greenlandic speakers is in this town called Tasilak. But their shipments mainly are limited to something I think July and August, and that's about it. They can get air shipments past that, but anything that comes in by boat, like your larger items, it, that's it, because the sea ice and the flow of the the ice is just too hard to navigate through for the rest of the year. 
So things like that will really limit um, where the towns are, where the settlements are, where the populations are. Wow. And so do many uh, young people tend to leave Greenland um, in search of other opportunities, go to Denmark, um, for example, for school or for work or? Yeah, as I mentioned, the economic opportunities. Yeah, with only one um, university here, a lot of folks will go to Denmark for school. Denmark, the universities there are free for Greenlanders, and the the, kid, the students here generally speak Danish, so it's an easy way to go over there. Um, there is some, uh, there are a lot of Greenlanders that end up going over there to stay. There are people that will, Greenlanders that will end up retiring over there because of weather. There's a huge amount of Greenlanders that will go over there for their study and then come back to Greenland to work. People here love where they're from. They want to make it better. They're invested in it. Our local staffer had studied in Denmark. She'd also studied for a year in the U.S. And she really, like, she's driven by making Greenland better. She wants to come back. Her family's here. It's something that's very important to her as a person to be here and to see it. There's a lot that you miss when you leave. You know, like I say, like the, the sea being so important and being able to go out on your boat to your hut and spend your summer out there. There's a lot of just ways of life that folks miss when they when they get far away from Greenland. So we are seeing there is, of course, a brain drain as there is everywhere. But there are a lot of folks that are coming back that are really like invested in reinvigorating Greenland and figuring out other ways forward. OK, I think we have just a couple of questions left uh, or sorry, a couple of minutes left that we can use questions for. So I'll try to, to squeeze in. Um, Here is one, I think, interesting question. Um, how do you handle moving around so many times every few years? And do you ever fall in love with a place so much that you wish you could stay for the rest of your career? Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> moving around. I think the, the hardest part of moving and most folks in the foreign service will tell you this, it's not getting to the place, it's saying goodbye to the place. After two years or three years, you've really just like fallen in love with so many different things. It's not just, you know, like, I know I'm going to miss my view of the fjord and I know I'm going to miss the icebergs. And I know I'm going to miss hiking around Nuuk and Greenland and seeing all these things, but I know I'm going to miss the people here probably most of all, right? Like those are the relationships that you form that really like stick in your heart. I'm really excited to be able to come back to Greenland in 20 years. When you see how much the, the population has changed between our first consulate and our second, you can see that there's going to be so much change still to come. I'm happy and excited that I get to be a part of that in terms of the U.S. Greenland relationship. And I just am really pumped about the idea that I'll come back in 20 years and, and be able to see something more different than, than today, you know, just to come back and like experience that in all the different parts around Greenland. Um, yeah, it is difficult to move. In the first, I'll say this, wherever you go in your life, if you end up finding you have to move to a new town, the first two to three months, you just say yes to everything, mm -hmm. just everything. After three months, you can allow yourself some no's, but those first two to three months are really crucial for getting out, doing what you can, eating just really strange foods. And then after that, you can say no. <laughs> um, okay, now I'm for real, two questions left. So one is, um, how did you choose, I, sorry, first, what is the thing you most enjoy about being a public affairs officer? And then how did you choose that versus, I don't know, an econ or a political? I'll say, I guess they're kind of both the same question. So um, when you sign up, when you're taking the test online, there's some sort of like personality quiz or whatever that the State Department has. And you can see like, oh, which cone are you? And you can take it. And it's just like, if you like these things, you should do this. So I took that, but I'd already, I, I saw the descriptions of like economics, political, consular, management, and public diplomacy. And like for all of them, it was like, no, 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 yes. Like I had no doubts that public diplomacy was what I wanted to do. In my view, it's by far the, the best part of the embassy and consulate. We have the best programs. We connect people more than anybody else does. And I feel like that's really what I joined the Foreign Service to do, was to try and like get those connections, make sure that people could go from one place to the other, that people in the U.S. get ex exposure to something that they've never seen before. When we bring a uh, person from a foreign country to the U.S. to your school or through a professional exchange or something like this, you get to learn about such a new perspective on the world. And I thought that that was just super important and the thing that I wanted to do. So for me, it was like, there was no other option. So it was public diplomacy or bust. So I'm really glad that I get to do it and I, I get to do it here. It's once in a lifetime. I'm never gonna be able to open up a consulate in the Arctic again, that's gonna be it. So. <laughs> Super exciting and just like uh, unreal. I really encourage everybody, if you're thinking about taking the foreign service test to just 
take it. It takes a long time to get in. So just take the test and then see how it goes and, and think about what's right for you. But I, I'm 100% public diplomacy all the way. The other parts are, are good too. Super important, super important. <laughs> so um, why don't we leave it off at, you know, you encourage folks if they're interested to take the test and to really consider this um, as a fantastic and rewarding career in so many ways. Um, are there specific recommendations you have for folks who, are, who might be considering taking the exam? Are there any specific things they can do to improve their chances, just you know, language skills, certain classes or things like that, that they may improve their chances of getting into the foreign service? I think um, there's a lot, people really can figure out how to game the system, but I also really firmly believe that one of the strengths of the foreign service is that we have such diverse backgrounds. I have friends that have come from all different areas of everything. I have a friend who's a management officer. So he works on like our overseas buildings and embassies and consulates and residences and these kinds of things. And, you know, with our construction staff, and all kinds. But his background was working at NASA. He has, uh, you know, degrees and PhDs in like space. And now here he is like working at our embassies in this completely different field. I, my degrees were in East Asian studies, which sounds relevant until you learn it was early 20th century Chinese feminism which nobody was really hiring for at the time or still. But nonetheless, I started working in like textbooks. So I was working in textbook public publishing before I joined the Foreign Service. I have other colleagues that everybody's just been doing so many different things or coming straight out of college or coming straight out of their master's program or they're switching over after 30 years working in a different field. So there's a lot that you can do. You can learn foreign language. Obviously, having an aptitude in foreign language helps. Um, you can take political science classes, but that it wasn't really what the test was on. A lot of the, the stuff is about you, your personal aptitude, your ability to be flexible when you go from place to place, how you engage, if you're good at like memorizing and like one small part on math, which I guess is really important, but okay. But um, take the test. My only advice is just take the test. It takes a really long time. The test is free. And then when you actually take the test, you learn what it is and you kind of get more of a feeling about it. And then as you progress, if you get past the test and you do the next part and then you do the next part, you'll figure out if it's right for you. But I always heard there was some advice that somebody gave me about if you're thinking about baking a pie, you should always stick a, a pound of butter in the freezer because you should always use really cold butter for pie. And like as soon as the word pie reaches your head, just stick the butter in the freezer. You won't regret it. So just like take the test. As soon as you think about taking the test, just sign up for it and take it. Well, thank you. I will leave everyone with those inspirational and inspiring words. Um, thank you, Even. This has been a fascinating discussion um, for me, certainly, and I hope for all of our um, folks who tuned in today. Thank you for taking us on this wild and, I will say, exotic journey through Greenland. Um, and your experience in reopening the consulate and, and everything just seems um, so valuable and so rewarding in so many ways. So thanks for taking the time to talk us through it. Um, and thank you for everyone who attended today um, for your fantastic questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through all of them, um, but there were just too many and time was too short. Um, so I do wanna say a few words before uh, we leave off for the day. And one is if you are interested in reading more about uh, the Arctic, we do have the Foreign Service Journal May issue is focused on all things Arctic, and you will actually be able to read Evan's article um, and learn more about her time in Greenland and all the things that she talked about um, in this article. And we'll be dropping the link to this article in the chat box. I will also send it as a follow up um, with the recording to all the folks who registered. Um, so we do have uh, moving on to, we do have a full program for the fall that we are developing. Um, I can't give you all the details yet, but we will be commemorating the 9-11 uh, 20th anniversary. We will be uh, celebrating the 60th anniversary, uh, anniversary of USAID in November. And we will also be talking about 30th anniversary of the fall of the USSR in December. So lots of exciting things are coming down the pike. Um, if you are not already ready on our distribution list for these events and for our newsletter, please sign up. Um, and if you're interested in attending these events that I just mentioned, please sign up by emailing events at AFSA.org. Um, and you can stay on top of the latest of what we're planning that way. 
And then finally, um, please do take just a few minutes to take that survey at the end of the session. It'll be greatly helpful. Let us know what kind of things you're interested in us covering in the future. We do plan on trying to cover more uh, different agencies as well and more different types of work as well. So um, let us know which ones in particular you're interested in. So thank you all for everything. Again, big thank you to Even, um, and see you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.